Dr. Grace O'Neill. Today I'm going to talk to you about COVID-19, the pandemic that we are currently facing. I'm an emergency physician in Hawaii. I've been asked by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii to do a presentation on COVID-19. In this lecture, I will be covering how COVID-19 originated, the structure of the virus and how it replicates. I will compare it to other coronaviruses. I will talk about the transmission and prevention of transmission and the characteristics of the illness, address vulnerable population segments, what we are doing to mitigate the virus, possible treatments, and how you can improve your immunity to the virus. So what are coronaviruses? Coronaviruses are a large family of enveloped RNA viruses that infect vertebrates. They are extensive in bats, but can infect other animals like birds, mammals, and humans. In humans, coronaviruses tend to cause the common cold. In the past few decades, there have been outbreaks of severe, sometimes fatal respiratory illnesses caused by novel coronaviruses. Corona is for crown for the crown-like spikes on the surface. Coronavirus 2019 is the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 is a zoonotic virus. Zoonoses are infectious disease caused by bacteria, viruses, or parasites that spread from non-human animals to humans. SARS-CoV-2 spreads easily and has a high morbidity and mortality. So how did SARS-CoV-2 originate? Authorities think it originated from the seafood market in Wuhan province, China. The market is a wet market or wildlife market where live and dead animals are sold for human consumption. Animals are wet or sitting in excrement and blood and close together and near humans making it easy for transmission. It is thought to originate from a bat, since the horseshoe bat transmitted SARS, and bats pass along viruses in their poop if they drop the feces on a piece of fruit that a different animal eats, that animal then becomes the carrier. Bats harbor a significantly higher proportion of zoonoses than other animals. The intermediate host is likely a scaly anteater called the pangolin. Similarity to both the bat virus and the pangolin virus suggests that the viruses from the two animals may have exchanged genes before infecting people. SARS also originated in a similar manner. SARS shares 80% of its genome with SARS-CoV-2 virus. The pangolin is a critically endangered anteater smuggled from Africa and Asia into China where it's sold for its meat and scales. Scales are thought to provide a variety of benefits in traditional Chinese medicine. The purchase of a pangolin in a market can go for up to $600 per kilo. Unfortunately, deforestation has dramatically affected areas available for pangolins foraging, putting them in closer contact with other animals, including bats, which are reservoirs for some dangerous viruses. Hunting and marketing of these exotic, environmentally threatened animals have often provided a path for pathogens to be transmitted to susceptible humans. Here's a diagram of the different coronaviruses and the likely animal transmission of these coronaviruses to humans. So the common ones that probably people have heard of would be the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, which was probably from a bat to a camel and then to humans, and then SARS, which was from a bat to a civet to humans, and obviously SARS-CoV-2, which is from a bat to a pangolin to humans. Here's a chart comparing the different kinds of common viruses and their mortality. So as we can see here, you have the common cold all the way on the right, and it is infected with close human contact and infected surfaces. 
and the mortality is close to zero. And then you have flu, which is from close human contact and infected surfaces as well. The mortality is 0.1%. Then we have the last two, SARS and COVID-19. As you can see, they're both human-to-human -human transmission and close contact, as well as from animals. And in SARS, the mortality rate was 10%, and in COVID-19, we think the mortality is somewhere between 1% to 4%. So what are the characteristics of SARS-CoV-2 virus? It binds to the ACE2 receptor in the cell. The ACE2 receptors are mostly in the lung, but also in the heart, nose, mouth, gut, spinal cord, skeletal muscle, and bladder or renal system. As you can see from this diagram, the virus enters the cell body through the ACE2 receptor, then it releases its viral RNA and uses the host cell's ribosome to replicate the RNA and make proteins, which are then packaged together to make new virus particles. And then it releases those virus particles. The virus enters the respiratory tract and then the mucous membrane and starts replicating itself in this manner. Then it causes inflammation because your body is trying to fight off the infection and the virus eventually enters the lung and the bloodstream and more symptoms begin to show. So how is the virus spread? It's mainly spread through droplets when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or speaks. The droplets are usually too heavy to hang in the air and they quickly fall on surfaces. However, you can be infected by breathing in the virus if you are within a certain amount of distance of a person who has COVID-19 or by touching a contaminated surface than touching your eyes, nose, or mouth before washing your hands. Researchers used a rotating drug to suspend the aerosols and provided Temperature and humidity levels closely mimicking hospital conditions, and they found that the virus stayed infectious for up to three hours, but the ability to infect drops sharply over time. So unless you are close to someone, the amount of virus you've been exposed to is probably very low. The incubation period is 1 to 14 days, but it can be up to 24 days. It's usually 4 to 5 days. So you're probably wondering how long the virus can last on surfaces. As you can see in this diagram, the virus can live up to three days on some surfaces like steel and plastic, though it's unlikely you will get it by touching these surfaces due to the reduced viral load over that time. The virus disintegrates over the course of one day on cardboard, and it's not viable on copper after four hours. When the virus becomes suspended in droplets smaller than five micrometers or aerosols, it can stay suspended for about a half an hour and then drift down and settle on surfaces. This is another study done on the stability of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in different environmental conditions. They found that the virus was highly stable at 39.2 degrees Fahrenheit, but at higher temperatures, the time for virus inactivation was reduced to about five minutes. There was no virus recovered from paper after about three hours, that's either tissue or printing paper, and no virus was detected from treated wood or cloth after about two days. The virus seems to be more stable on smooth surfaces like glass, or banknote. There was no virus detected on day four or stainless steel and plastic on day seven. That standard disinfectants worked quite well with no virus detected after five minutes of placing disinfectant on them. 
The only thing that took about 15 minutes was soap. Given this data that the virus stays longer on steel and plastic, I would recommend wiping off your credit card when you go and pay for things. So how far do you have to stand away from someone who has the virus when they sneeze? There was a study done suggesting that droplets of various sizes are trapped in a turbulent gas cloud when someone coughs or sneezes, allowing them to travel up to 26 feet. The drops will fall continuously depending on their weight. The most visible drops will fall within six feet of the person. So what can we do to stop the spread of the virus? We can definitely stay far away from each other and cover our mouth when we sneeze or cough, avoid touching our eyes and infecting ourselves. We can try to clean frequently used surfaces like doorknobs. We want to avoid shaking hands during this time of the pandemic. I found this in the LA Times of alternative greetings that we can do instead of shaking hands. There's a namaste, a salute, and the Spock Vulcan salute. Take your pick. I wanted to talk a little bit about face masks. The primary purpose of a face mask is to protect the healthcare worker or if you are someone who is sick, to put it on to prevent the healthcare worker from getting sick from your respiratory droplets and aerosols. The CDC did not recommend face masks earlier because they did not want people to go out and buy a bunch and prevent healthcare workers from getting masks. Masks can be 50% effective also in preventing the virus. However, if you reuse the mask and there are some respiratory droplets on the mask and you put it on the next day and you touch your face, you can inadvertently infect yourself with the virus. That being said, I think a face mask is a good way to prevent people from not spreading the virus when they may be asymptomatic shedders of the virus. Here is some information or websites you can go to to make your own mask the CDC has some quick t-shirt face coverings that you don't even have to sew and they also have one with a bandana. If you don't feel like making one, Etsy has some you can buy online and you would be supporting small businesses. So I think one of the most important things you can do to prevent yourself from contracting the COVID-19 virus is to wash your hands carefully. Your hand is a vector of infection. The virus has a fatty layer and soap has the ability to crack the envelope and kill the virus. Wash your hands for at least 20 seconds because your hands have nooks and crannies for the soap to enter and you have to rub and wash these nooks and crannies to lift the virus from the surfaces with soap. So what percentage of people who get the virus die from the virus? This is called the case fatality rate. In large studies in China, they found that between 2 to 3 percent of patients were dying, but in Italy, about 7.2 percent of patients were dying. Why do we see a higher case fatality rate in Italy versus China? Experts believe that it is due to the older population of Italy, since the overwhelming majority of people who are affected by the virus are elderly people. Here we are finding that young people are more affected by the virus than in China. Many people in their 30s and 40s have 
underlying conditions here like diabetes and high blood pressure but there are still young people without medical problems getting the virus. Therefore, even if you are young, you can still be infected with the virus and you are not invulnerable. Another thing is that young people can be a vector for someone else who might be at greater risk. So what kind of conditions make people vulnerable to COVID-19 besides having an age greater than 60? Smokers are more vulnerable, and other pre-existing conditions include heart disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, abnormally high blood pressure, cancer, and obesity. Fortunately, a lot of these conditions are preventable or treated with a plant-based diet and lifestyle changes. Some experts have also noticed a trend that more men then women get sicker with the virus. There is also some theories about why this is. Some people speculate because the male has only one copy of the X chromosome that they do not have as many immune responses as females do. Females have a more robust immune system which is why they have more autoimmune disease too. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about special populations like children. Children tend to have milder illness and upper respiratory tract symptoms. There's speculation that this is because they are more exposed to other coronaviruses which may give them some degree of protection against COVID-19. They also have a more robust natural immune response. As we age, we become more susceptible to a wide variety of infectious diseases. Children less than one years old or one to five years old may be more susceptible. What about pregnant women? We do not know a lot about pregnant women. There was a case series of nine women with COVID-19 who had good outcomes with no vertical transmission, which means there was no transmission from mother to baby during delivery and the virus was not detected in their breast milk. However, there was one case of possible vertical transmission during delivery that was written up as a case report. So we don't have a lot of information on pregnant women. So I'm going to go through now what has been done and what we are doing to suppress this virus. As you can see, some other countries that have controlled COVID-19 relatively well have taken measures early on to control the virus, like Korea and Taiwan. They enacted early testing, drive-through testing stations, mobile apps, and contact tracing, as well as temperature screening at airports and schools to control the virus, whereas we did not do any of those things. Therefore, we have had to pay with more expensive measures such as travel bans, closure of public schools, universities, stopping mass gatherings, things that are more expensive economically. We have to do this so we can flatten the curve and prevent our health systems from collapsing. If we can reduce the spread of the virus with social distancing, this will allow time for us to develop treatment for the disease as well as possibly a vaccine. 
Also, this way we can make sure we have enough ventilators and other equipment to treat our sickest patients. Because we had these limitations on testing, it meant that we had no accurate picture of how widely the disease was spread, and it was already here before we had the test running in full force. Let's talk about testing now. So first, we have the COVID-19 PCR test. The problem with this test is the sensitivity is poor. It is probably 60 to 70% sensitive. So if you test negative, you may have the virus, but a very low viral load that is not detectable. You can test positive even after you get better. So it does not necessarily indicate an active infection. Next, we have rapid antibody testing, which is relatively new. This is a serology test, which means it's a blood-based test that can be used to identify whether people have been exposed by looking at their immune response. These tests give greater detail into the prevalence of the disease in the population by identifying people who already have developed antibodies to the virus. The IgM antibodies indicate if the patient has had an active or recent infection. The IgG antibodies develop later following the infection and usually don't begin to appear until 7 to 10 days after infection. It indicates past infection but does not exclude patients that have recently been infected and are contagious, especially if it is detected with the IgM antibodies. A positive result for IgM or IgG does not mean the patient's current symptoms are due to COVID-19, though. Another problem is not all patients will develop a detectable IgG or IgM response to SARS-CoV-2. The sensitivity of the antibody test is unknown. So what are the common symptoms that COVID-19 causes? The most common symptoms are a fever and dry cough. Other symptoms include fatigue. Some patients have sputum with their cough difficulty breathing, sore throat, and headache. Other less common symptoms include chest pain, pink eye, and loss of a sense of smell. Most people's symptoms are mild and they should just stay home. About 13.8% of the patients are having severe symptoms and need to be hospitalized and 4.7% of patients are critical in the intensive care unit. And those patients with severe disease, shortness of breath was present in 37% of the patients at admission compared to 15% of those without severe disease. There's probably about 25 to 50% of patients who are completely asymptomatic. Is there seasonality in the virus? We're hoping that our mitigation combined with our onset of the summer season will help diminish the virus. Classical seasonal viruses like the benign coronaviruses or flu viruses tend to go away in the summer and then come back in the fall. We don't know what is going to happen with the virus because it is a new virus. So what should you do if you test positive for COVID-19? If you test positive, please self-quarantine. The recommended quarantine is for 14 days. After resolution of your symptoms, or at least 72 hours after the resolution of fever and two negative swabs 24 hours apart, you can return to work. If you are not going to be retested, make sure your fever has resolved for three days, respiratory symptoms have resolved, and make sure it's greater than seven days from the onset of your illness. Wear your mask at home and self-isolate from your family. Do people develop immunity after the infection? There is an antibody response, but unknown if this is protective. For other coronaviruses, people do develop immunity, but it is transient and wanes and reinfection can occur. So is there any treatment for COVID-19? There are trials looking into drugs that do multiple things, like block the ACE2 receptor, the machinery that it uses to replicate, 
or kill the factory of the virus itself. Remdesivir is a broad spectrum antivirus specific to RNA viruses. Monoclonal antibodies are being looked into by the FDA as well. Hydroxychloroquine, an anti-inflammatory used in the treatment for malaria, has in vitro activity against coronavirus. This is being used with azithromycin. Viagra is being researched as well since nitrous oxide appears to kill SARS-CoV-2. There is also a possibility for convalescent serum from people who survive COVID-19. Antibodies from these people are given to people who have severe COVID-19, but unfortunately, this also has a possible danger of transmitting other infections. Since people have heard of the possibility of chloroquine being used to treat COVID-19, some people have taken it upon themselves to buy chloroquine. So much so that there is a shortage of it. One person, as you can see from the CDC health advisory, took chloroquine that he got from an aquarium and died from it. Please do not take any of these medications as we do not know if they work yet. They are still all being researched by the FDA. These medications all have side effects, as any medication has side effects. So how can you improve your own immunity? I spoke a little bit before about how a plant-based diet can help prevent some chronic medical problems. Another thing is that a plant-based diet is low in fat, and high-fat diets are immunosuppressive. Nutrition is critical for the delivery of energy sources and the support of essential bodily processes. Vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin D, which you can obtain from these different plant sources, are critical micronutrients. Deficiencies in these micronutrients can impair immune function. It's also important to keep your gut healthy. 70% of your immunity is in your gut. Also keep well hydrated because this keeps the mucus thin and it's easier to remove the mucus from your body this way. Avoid refined sugar and excess alcohol intake as excess alcohol intake can increase susceptibility to infection by depleting lymphocytes and suppressing production of cytokines. How about a vaccine? It will take several months to see if it is even safe for a phase one trial. It'll take about a year to 1.5 years before we know if we'll have a vaccine that works. It may be much longer. There are trials with the BCG vaccine that is used for tuberculosis currently. Here are some websites you can go to to keep up to date on COVID-19. Hopefully we can suppress this virus. In the meantime, try to keep healthy on a whole foods plant-based diet this will prevent you from chronic diseases that put you at more risk for having the dangerous consequences of contracting this virus. I am hopeful that in the future, our world will come together and try to eliminate wet markets and other sources of animal viruses that can spread to humans and cause terrible consequences. Thank you for your attention. In the meantime, there's nowhere that I'd rather self-isolate than Hawaii. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment area below. Please check out my blog at graceinhawaii.com and my personal YouTube channel is Graceful Living 365.